So my second lecture is also like my first lecture. It's part of the uh, European Association of Geochemistry and I don't have to introduce myself more, so I will continue straight. And I will try to talk about some of the novel technique that uh, we are using in spillosem research for paleohydrological studies. And I talk a little bit, I will talk a little bit about work uh, that we are doing uh, on clamped isotope and on uh, fractionation and on fluid inclusion. But before talking about what we are doing, I want to say that what you are doing here is even better. <laughs> and we are, um, uh, the work of uh, the group of Attila, Georgi, are doing excellent work about this type of question. I will just maybe apply what we are doing to all the spellosem and tell us what we're doing in our region, how it's different, but I can't start my talk without giving the compliment to you here in Hungary. So again, we saw this slide. We saw this slide. We have to know now. We really want to unravel either the delta 18 of the water or the temperature or both of them. We want to also unravel the influence of the a very a high resolution into understanding seasonality. Because when we are monitoring, we don't monitor over hundreds of years. We don't even monitor about 50 years. We monitor year by year, season by season, sometimes every storm track, every rain event. And why? Because we want to understand how spillers register high resolution, not just averaging processes, by really resolving seasonal uh, changes. So I will talk about the seasonality, the high resolution work we're doing on the seasonality uh, and the fluid inclusion and clamped isotope to resolve problem of uh, fractionation temperature and water composition in the paleo record that I showed you here. So as we know, uh, we start with the ocean, we go, we start with the ocean, we go to the atmosphere, then the rainfall drop and uh, continue. There are processes in the unsaturated zone and then eventually come to the Spiliocene. This is from a paper of Lanchiet. And we want to understand what happened in this uh, large scale process. Again, I will talk about the Eastern Mediterranean, but it can be applied to everywhere. What we're doing is we're monitoring a rainfall above the cave. At the same time that we're monitoring rainfall, we also monitor the dust because this uh, monitoring system uh, is able to close and open itself. So we have wet dust and dry dust. We monitor the dust during when there is no rain. We monitor the rain and we monitor also the dust that comes from the rain. And then we monitor the cave. We are doing, we started monitoring already in the uh, early 90s, but now we are doing our monitoring work you know, as you work more and more and more, you realize that you want to know a much higher resolution monitoring. So now we have students who works on really, really fine monitoring and uh, harvesting cult site and monitoring the cave after each rainfall event. Because as I say, the water come into the cave system through cracking, through um, pores in the Vadu zone, most of the slow dripping represent these pores, this water that reside in the pore and then pushed via the new rainfall. So there is a lot of mixing processes here and there is water coming after rainfall event much faster into the cave, sometime after. We need about 50 millimeter of rainfall, depend how uh, deep the cave is and in an area where the cave is deeper, we need 200 millimeter of annual rainfall before we get the signal. And we know from tritium, from tritium work that the water can reside in the unsaturated zone almost up to 30 years. 
We do a lot of monitoring of the, uh, the relationship between the delta within of the average annual rainfall and the amount of rainfall because we want to understand how this is registered in the spillosome. And as I showed you, there is a large seasonality pattern in the cave water. Interestingly, as I told you, in the last uh, 10 years, we have drought and we lose this seasonality. We lose this seasonality, it means spilosem are still forming, but we don't see this seasonality pattern anymore. And here you see the rainfall amount from 1990 to 2012, now we have it to 2014, 15, and you see that during this period of drought, there is very little changes in the cave water delta O18, so this is the dry period, and during wet period, we have a very large isotopic changes in the delta O18 of the cave water when the amount of rainfall is uh, higher. So we have two end uh, member. During wet year, the cave is much more variable in the isotopic composition of the water. And the reason is that if we look at the previous slide, if we look at the isotopic, composition, the isotopic composition of rainfall as a function of the months, we see that at the peak of the rainy season, when the amount of rainfall is the maximum, the delta O18 is the lowest. And at the end of the, system, the year and the beginning of the rainy season, the delta O18 of the water is the highest. Therefore, in the unsaturated zone, when we have a mixing, the water of the summer, which migrate into the cave, are usually with higher isotopic composition because the new rain will, uh, it will uh, mix with the rain from the previous uh, year. We see very little evaporation in the unsaturated zone because the water that reached the cave be, uh, due to the, we know this because the delta O18, delta D of the water that reached the cave show that the water lie on the Mediterranean meteoric water line and they don't lie on evaporative line. So we know that this is due to mixing in the unsaturated zone, this large seasonality. The temperature on the cave is constant, almost constant. So the large isotopic composition that we see on a seasonal basis depend very much on the amount of rainfall during the winter months. Another thing that is important for our region, if we look at the delta O18, delta D of the rainfall, global rainfall, we see that the Mediterranean Sea sits here. And the reason that the Mediterranean Sea shift from the global meteoric water line is due to the fact that we have a rainfall coming from the Atlantic Ocean and from the European continent. It's, it's a very cold air and it meets the warm Mediterranean vapor and as a result you, uh, uh, for these kinetic uh, processes we get the Mediterranean meteoric water line with a D excess of about 20 to 30 which is uh, differ from the global meteoric line which have a D excess of 10 on the relationship between delta D and delta O18. So we characterize our water system. As I say, the global meteoric water line, delta D is equal A times delta O18 plus a D excess of 10, and the Mediterranean meteoric water line has a D excess of 20 to 30. Now this is very important when we want to understand past processes, uh, how in the past uh, was the rainfall pattern, was the interaction between the Mediterranean Sea and the westerlies differ from present day. So for us, these relationships are very important. When we look, uh, so we do a lot of monitoring on the cave and we look at water that come, uh, the, the rain that is more than 15 millimeter usually follow the Mediterranean water meteoric water line, rainfall below 15 millimeter, many times fall on uh, evaporation line due to evaporation below the clouds. But when we look at cave water, the cave water follow the Mediterranean meteoric water line. I want to tell you something else about our rain in our region, that all rainfall 
that is below 10 millimeter, most of the rainfall that is below 10 millimeter can occur in much warmer temperature and most of this rainfall don't reach the cave system. It wet the soil but it doesn't reach the cave system. So we have a real bias towards heavier uh, rainfall events and if we look at the global uh, pattern you can see that we all own the Mediterranean meteoric water line. The, the isotopic composition, the delta D, delta O18 can change, but the relationship is uh, the Mediterranean meteoric water line. So uh, as, you say, as you saw, the isotopic composition uh, of the spillow, same we say, depend on several parameters, but we have to unravel the temperature and the temp delta O18 of the water. So I'll start with our first aim is to, our first objective is to obtain a sub-annual resolution to understand seasonal variation in the cave water and how the spilosome react to it. Because sometimes when we are looking at spilosome, the forming, the depositing very, very quickly. We can take a thick spilosome and it can form in a matter of a, a, hundred years and we can see lamination, seasonal and early lamination. And we want to understand this lamin we want to understand why. If a spellosem was formed very, very fast, obviously there was a lot of rain in the system. So we have to have high precision, high spatial resolution of delta O18 analysis. And this we are doing with collaboration with uh, uh, John Valley and Ian Orland in um, medicine, we're using the iron probe. At the same time, we try to image the annual bands. The reason we have to, to image the annual bands is that not always we can do it via microscope and not always we can do it via scanning electron microscope because what give us the, for instance, we're looking here at Spilosem that grew from 1990 to 2008. You can see it here, and we will try to understand the seasonality. I will finish the sentence. Not always we can uh, really see the sublamination by optical microscope or by, uh, um, by uh, um, scanning electron microscope. We do a lot of work with confocal fluorescence microscope because the confocal uh, fluorescence microscope enables the emission of light which is characteristic of organic molecules. So when the water reaches the cave, they contain organic, organic molecules from the soil. So we have humic and fulvic acids, and they give us different color of green. When we do a conventional isotopic measurements, we take about 0.5 millimeter drill spot. When we do SIMS analysis, iron probe analysis, we do a 10 micron point. So you can think how much we average when we do a conventional um, uh, drilling. We think that we work on high resolution, but the definition of high resolution depends on the growth, how fast the spillosem grow, but also it depends very much on the technique we're using. So here you see different green. And this different green is due to different humic acids. So we see a dark green and a light green and a lighter green moving to a darker green. And we want to see if it's reflected in the isotopic composition of the spilosem. So this is the Kamika ion microprobe. It's using a cesium ion beam which emit Oxygen and delta O18 is about 0. Point, uh, plus minus the, the error is about 0. 0.3 per mil. Give us a lot of information. So when we looked at the delta O18 of the water in, the, in our region, you saw that there was a very large difference between winter and summer. When we look at these bands with the ion microprobe, we can see that it changes between a lower value to higher value, lower value to higher value, lower value to higher value. The lowest value are the bright zone, the higher value are the dark zone. 
So uh, we did a lot of work on uh, analyzing the organic matter of the water, and we know that the dark zone is usually the higher delta O18 today, and the bright zone is associated with lower delta O18. So the dark zone is organic poor, and the high zone is rich, uh, is organic rich, is the wet season. So we have some kind of indication to the, to the seasonality. What does the seasonality mean? And what we are doing also, because as I say, the winter water come at the beginning of the, of the season. It's the mid, it's not the beginning, it's the mid winter. And the, delta, the higher delta O18 usually reflect in the water system the end of the season. So what we do, we use the cap delta to calculate to, to calculate the intensity of the rainfall, as I will show you soon. So that's, you saw the delta O18 of the water. Here you see how the spillosome behave in a very high resolution. This is the spillosome that grew from 1990 to 2008. Imagine if we would have done, all this is, a, this is half a millimeter, if we done a, just normal uh, isotopic composition, we would have get two points. See how many points we got with the iron probe. This is the rainfall. This is the delta O18 of the spillosome. Now, the early 90s were very wet in Israel. And then suddenly, in 1998, we started to get drought. So see, during the early 90s, we have wet, dry, wet, dry. So this is winter, summer, winter, summer. We see very large seasonality and very large variation in the delta O18 of the spillosome. When we go to the drought season, we get a very diffused bending because we have very little seasonality as you saw in the water. So we know that this period represents a long period of drought, and this period represents a lot of rainfall. You can see also the changes in the color of the spillosome. So we have some kind of a recorder to the amount of rainfall. This is the entire spillosome. So the cap delta is a rain gauge. We use it as a rain gauge because it tells us the difference between the peak of the rain and the summer water. So if we take the delta O18 of the rainfall since uh, 90, this is since 1990, 90, 92 to 2013, I think, and we take the cap delta on this pillow same that we measure that was deposited from, uh, from 1990 to 2003, and we analyze the annual rainfall from the cap delta and the change in the annual rainfall as measured, we see a very nice correlation. So we can use this cap delta for spillosome that were formed recently. I'll say, I don't know, um, I will say in the last, in my opinion, in the later part of the Holocene when the sea surface condition remain the same and the sea level is the same. We can do, you can, we can use it to calculate changes in the annual rainfall, in the amount of rainfall in our region. Because we get a very nice correlation between the delta O18 of the spillosome and the amount of rainfall. So this cap delta is a very good rain gauge for late Holocene sample. And this is a late Holocene sample that we worked on. It just didn't show us anything when we did the first analysis. We show we get very flat, very flat delta O18 record. We saw that the uh, earlier part was more, they were deposited faster. The later part was deposited slower. This same grew from about 2,000 years ago to about 900 years ago. But what is interesting, when we did the very, very detailed dating, 
with a SIMS analysis, we saw that the fast growth occurred between 2,200 to about 1,500, and then there is much lower, slower growth with much less amplitude. This is the spilosome. So this is its later part, this is its earlier part. And we think about, when we think about it, what it represents in terms of archaeology. Okay, we also did, uh, we tried to do some kind of uh, de cap delta delta O18 to reconstruct uh, the changes in the paleo rainfall, and we came to changes that show that from about 2000 to about 1800, we had an average of about 800 millimeters, moving between this one and this one, and then it it dropped to about 600 millimeter, more like present day, and then we have much lower resolution. But we see that the average annual rainfall dropped. When we look at the history of the region, we see that the Roman period was much, much wetter. And then we're coming to the Byzantine period. Here we hypothesize the volcanic eruption. Then we started with all the wars and the average manual rain of rainfall dropped. And if we looked at what happened today in the Middle East, no doubt that this last drought that we get in the last 10 years influenced what's going on in the entire region with all the, with all the, you know, the awful things that happened today with the, with the exodus of, the, of so many people out of their place in Syria, in Iraq. Now, if we look at spillovers and the grew between 35,000 to recent, the picture is different. Before we saw, in the Holocene, we saw that the bright lamina had lower delta O18 and the dark lamina had higher delta O18. When we look at the last glacial and the Heinrich event, we see the opposite, that the bright, that the dark, the bright lamina has higher delta O18, and the dark lamina has lower delta O18. So there is a change in the pattern of the seasonality, and this can be due to uh, what happened in the soil when the climate is much colder. When the climate is much colder, we have much more snow. The snow melts first, and the productivity of the soil changes a bit later, so that is what we assume is happening, and that's why we have different bending. So we use this bending, changes in bending, to relate it to climate changes. I, this, is, this is too detailed, I just want to tell you that there is difference between the Holocene lamination from diffusional bright to dark and then dark, and during a, a last glacial, we see that it's much more cyclistic, or during the under dryas, it's much, much more cyclistic. So there is changes in the overall pattern of seasonality in the Eastern Mediterranean as function of climate, um, as function of climate. Another thing that uh, we ask ourselves, like you ask ourselves here, is uh, trying now to unravel the isotopic equilibrium in cave environment. Is really cave environment is the best laboratory to study equilibrium versus non-equilibrium reaction. And like you, we put, and like you, we put, we have a, we have a skull site on glasses, we, uh, we monitor the water, we monitor the water as a drip, from the dripping point as they migrate on a cascades of water to see if there is differences. We put harvest glass under fast drip, slow drip, pool water, different uh, rock, a different thickness of rock before the surface to try and understand the system. And the system is not simple because if, uh, I didn't put everything here, but if you look at various uh, uh, lines that were formed, what's called the equilibrium line, and this is the work of Tremaine in 2011. He took Spilosem from different parts of the world, and he came out with the suggestion that uh, the cave actually show a cave line, an analog equilibrium or semi-equilibrium line for a cave. But even if you put a point from different cave, 
they can fall here, they can fall here, and the question, can we use which line is the best to use? We used in the past Kim and O'Neill, now we are, maybe we'll use the more, um, more recent line that was suggested by Tremaine, but I can tell you that we don't know what is the line. We don't know if there is a line. Because when we take spirosem that we did lately, during drought years, during wet years, under fast drip, slow drip pool, we get everything. Look at it. This is the Sorek range. This is all the line. So the question is, what is a line? On the other hand, and we try to try and figure out if the differences is associated with different petrography, and we cannot find anything. But when we do handy test, as I told you, we do handy test, we get an equilibrium. When we look at spillosome from different parts of the cave and different caves, and even globally, we, sh we sh show you that the signal is a global signal. There is some equilibrium. So the question is, what do we monitor? When we monitor, we monitor the drop as it comes out on the surface, and CO2 is the gas, and calcite is deposited. Is this is the best place to monitor? Or we have to monitor the water as a, a migrate through the cave. There is also a question of time, because once the spill of um, the, the calcite is formed, water continues dripping, and we might have some post-depositional processes, and eventually the, the, cave, the, the cave come to some kind of equilibrium. And maybe the study of Tremaine taking a spill of sand from different caves in the world tell us something about a kind of cave analog line that maybe this is the most correct thing, maybe not. Maybe each cave has its different line. Another thing that we are doing, and you are doing it here, is looking at a clamped isotope. And we're looking at clamped isotope because clamping is a function of temperature. It doesn't depend on the delta oitin of water. So as like any other, like any other technique, it has a big, big promise at the, at the beginning. And as we are using more and more the technique, we realize that it tells us a lot of things about reaction, but it's not necessarily so straightforward. And we have, again, like in any other system, to understand, the, to understand what happened as part of kinetic effect. So we're using the clamped isotope thermometry. It measures the prefer preference of cysteine and oitin to create a bond which is, which, with each other in the carbonate lattice. And we use the, uh, we use the delta 47, sorry, we use the delta 47 as a per mil deviation in abundance of CO2 mass 47 from random distribution. And random distribution is high temperature property. As I told you, the delta 47 is temperature de dependent at a thermodynamic equilibrium, and it doesn't depend on the delta 18 of water, only on temperature. And for this, we have to have a special mass spectrometer because we measure very, very, um, uh, very little uh, changes. And like in delta 18, that we see there is a shift due to kinetic uh, processes. Also, there is a shift and a depletion in delta 47 relative to equilibrium. This is the spillosem relative to what is called equilibrium from a bulk of water. We see in the cave environment that we have a depletion in delta 47 and enrichment in delta 18. So we have to understand how to use the clamped isotopes in spillosem. So we study it with uh, Allen and Hagita Feck and other people from our group. And uh, th there is the, we, the calibration for fractionation 
at our cave temperature, which is 72 degrees today, and the kinetic fractionation, and we see that the most of our results fall somewhere here. Here are the late Holocene samples, here are present day samples, and we see that they fall somewhere, sorry, in between these two lines. So for our purposes, we use the midpoint value to, uh, in order to use the results of the 47 and translate them to temperature. Now the question that we ask ourselves, how to unravel this record? Unlike um, the very high resolution that we can do with just convention Delta 018, when we work with Delta 47, it's a new method, it's, it's, we, are, it's, we are new in the field, takes time, we cannot do it in the same resolution. But what we see when we do the Delta 47 on this record, that at a transition from last glacial to peak interglacial, we see the determination is not smooth. The Delta 18 shows us that it occurs in steps. It also was found in Spilo same from Turkey, that it occurs in steps. And it's also found in the, when we're working on, uh, that's the work of, uh, of uh, Mosley and Dominique Fleitman. And we see that it occurs in steps. We start with very cold temperature, about 12 degrees at the peak of the previous glacial to a maximum around 140,000. There is a quite a large error because we don't work at the same resolution and then cooling again and maximum temperature about 120,000 years ago of 24 degrees, slightly higher than present. The error are quite, la quite large, but there is also error on the age here. And then drop from the last, to the last glacial and what, to the last uh, interglacial, we see peak interglacial here. And then what you can see that about 50, 56,000 years ago, when I told you that there is evidence for the migration out of Africa and we have evidence for warming in our region, we see it also in the clamped isotopes, temperature reached almost values of present day and then drop to the peak of the last glacial to about 12 degrees. And again, the termination is very noisy with the younger dryas, with Heinrich events and the Holocene temperature. So we believe that the clamp isotope gave us very, with the error, gave us very, very important information. So when we do this clamp isotope, we want to calculate the delta 18 of the water. And we see a large change in the delta 18 of the water, of the rainwater, of the cave water from previous glacial into peak interglacial, a change of about, my, of about five per mil, then a stabilization, and a very large changes during the transition from the last glacial into the early Holocene. Again, changes of about a three per mil in the rainwater delta, in the cave water delta 18, which is associated with changes in temperature, but also associated with changes in the sea surface delta 18. Another thing that we are doing in Israel, and you're doing it here, we're looking at a fluid inclusion, inclusion the traps trapped into the speleosome as a form. We want to analyze the water, the original water from the speleosome. We do it in the line of uh, Uber von Hof in Amsterdam, and the results that we get are very interesting because again, this is the record. Now we want to know the delta weighting of the water, directly the delta weighting of the water. Again, we look at the transition from, last, from the previous glacial into the peak interglacial, a big change in the delta weighting of the water. You will see that it's similar to the change that we see when we calculate the delta 18 of the water from the clamped isotope, then we go into the interglacial and the uh, last glacial and the termination, a change of about five per mil from the last glacial into the peak of the Holocene. Now with fluid inclusion, we have a lot of problem in the Eastern Mediterranean Spilosem because they contain, some of them contain very little 
sorry, some of them contain very little inclusion because we are on the border of the desert, so we have a, a lot of problem of yield, so we cannot analyze all the, all the spillosem. It's a quite hard work, but from what we analyze, this is the picture that we get. And when we compare now the temperature measured directly from the clamped isotope from the delta 47 with the error and the temperature that we measured, that we calculated from the fluid inclusion, we see that despite the fact that we're working on different size pillows, and for fluid inclusion we need much larger sample, and despite the fact that it's totally two different methods, the results are quite good. And this is encouraging us and tell us we should continue. And this is the delta 18 of the water based on fluid inclusion in blue and the calculated from the clamped isotope. So we have a very good confidence that these two methods should be worked together and they tell us something very important about real temperature and real changes in delta 18 of water. And you ask me which line we calculated here, we use the Tremaine line. Another thing that we are trying to figure out if there was a change in the delta 18, delta D relationship, because as I told you, today we get the rain from the continent, from, uh, Europe, from the uh, North European continent, coming over the Mediterranean Sea, picking up the moist, the warm moist air of the Mediterranean Sea. We want to know if this D excess uh, also prevailed in the past. And because we analyze both the delta O18 and the delta D using the fluid inclusion, we can calculate the D excess. And what you can see, the D excess value sh shift from the global meteoric water line during the last glacial. So during the last glacial, we were at the global meteoric water line. It means either that the sea surface of the Mediterranean was much colder and there was not this big kinetic effect as today, or we had different storm track or different wind speed that cooled the water, but we moved from global meteoric water line into the DX of, of 20 to 30 during the Holocene, and this is true also at the transition from the peak of the last previous glacial into the peak interglacial stage 5E. So I would like to conclude and say something about the combined fluid inclusion and clamped isotope that a kinetically corrected clamped isotope temper temperature and calculated fluid inclusion temperature based on the main line come to show a broad agreement, although there are some exceptions that we still need to address. Uh, the record showed 10 to 12 degree warming between peak glacial in, and interglacial, and we see the oscillation during the termination. And the directly measured fluid inclusion and the calculated delta 47, delta 18 show a shift of 3 to 5 per mil at the termination. Part of it is due to sea surface delta 18 and uh, part of it is due to temperature. There is also a D-axis effect, and that there is a general trend towards cooling throughout the glacial, because uh, we see a general increase in the spillosem delta O18. If you look, we can see a general increase in the spillosem delta O18. Uh, whereas there is almost constant water composition. If I go back, there is almost constant water composition here. Um, and the D-axis value sh shift from the global meteoric water line at the glacial maximum to the meteoric water line in the interglacial and it can be reflecting either higher relative humidity, because today we have a big change in the relative humidity between the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, cool air from the European continent. So during the LGM, there was higher relative humidity, 
and it can be caused by different storm track. We might have the westerly coming a little further to the south. Um, it's a possibility. It might be higher wind stress. We know that the glacial was much higher with wind. We do a lot of work on strontium isotopic composition of spelosem and neodymium isotopic composition. And we see when we do the strontium isotope and the neodymium isotope that there was much more impact of dust coming from the Sahara during the peak glacial. So must have been higher wind stress during the peak of the glacial. And I would like to finish here and to thank you for your patience to sit for such a long time and listen to me. Thank you. So I think we can be really grateful. It was a very hard work to provide us such a, a long lecture, actually quite a, an extensive one. But in this case, we could see uh, the whole range from the basic information to the cutting edge research, like the plum isotope, the uh, things. So now uh, the uh, lecture is open for discussion. So if you have any uh, question or, or comment, please. Okay, so I, I will start. <laughs> so um, you showed a, a beautiful study based on ion micropop analysis and you measured oxygen isotope composition. Uh, did you measure also uh, trace element contents to see these seasonal variations? Yeah. Because if you have wet and dry seasons, then uh, you should change some, you should see some changes in the strontium magnesium. Yeah, we, we did a lot of work both on the iron probe, and it's published, and on the laser ablation on the trace elements. The picture of the trace elements is much more complicated, but there are, you know, there are stories that uh, I didn't bring it, I, I don't discuss it here, there are too many things, I can't talk about everything, but we did uh, together with the iron probe, we did trace elements and followed the iron probe on the same section, we did also um, laser ablation to see if it fits. We also did with the iron probe carbon isotopic analysis. This is still not published. This is still, we are still trying to understand it. But there is very big changes in the carbon isotopic analysis on a seasonal basis that cannot be explained by vegetation changes, but can be explained by the production of different organic matter to the soil in dry period versus wet period. Thank you. Okay, now Joseph. My special field is isotope hydrogeology. And isotope? I, hydrogeology. Yeah. And I was very interested in your uh, result that about 120,000 years ago was also a, a glacial peak, as I saw. No, it's 20,000 years ago and 100. 20,000 years ago, wasn't it? No, uh, 120 and 180,000 are peak interglacial. Yes, interglacial? Yeah, mm -hmm. peak interglacial. And when was the last peak of the coldest peak? It's about 135, 140. Yes. It's interesting for us because we could find on the Great Hungarian Plain uh, very old groundwaters having very negative delta 18 by the Rozhanskis and other equation is about zero plus one centigrade was the temperature at the infiltration and now in Hungary is 10, 11 centigrade. So it would be very interesting to correlate this age of this groundwater with the cold peak what you showed. These are too old to be from the last glacial maximum. Are these data published? Our data? Yes. Of course. Not, a, not a, The clamped isotope and the fluid inclusion is not published, but the rest of it is published. Yes. Uh, we are now working on the clamped isotope and the fluid inclusion paper, yes. but the rest is published. What you should be aware is the very interesting work that was done lately on, um, on Siberian and Mongolian spelosem by our ex-student and he worked together in Oxford together with Gideon Henderson and they looked at period of the sowing of the permafrost of, in Siberia and um, 
they, they show when, using the spillow stem, what, what was the temperature in order to sow the permafrost. So they talk about one and a half degree Celsius, average of one and a half degree Celsius, and the last one I think it's about 128,000 years ago. The paper was published in Science. I, uh, Any other question or comment? Uh, I know that you are an expert in uranium thorium age dating as well, so uh, di you didn't touch this problem but, or this uh, new technique, but uh, I'd like to ask your opinion about the laser ablation assisted uh, multi collector ICTMS analysis where you can date, although with a worse precision or, or a not that good precision, but still at a very high resolution. Uh, we are now trying to buy a laser, a, a, a laser ICPMS to do dating of spilosim, both with uranium lead and uranium thorium, because it's faster. And it's uh, easier because you don't have to do all the chemical separation. I don't know how good it is, but it's very good to have it because it's very, it will be faster and maybe less expensive. But I cannot tell you now, uh, I can, I'm sure that that is going to be part of the future. We are going to try it anyhow. Yeah, great. Um, and uh, maybe a last question about uh, geothermometry. Uh, have you tried uh, this uh, new method for, of the laser uh, assisted uh, bubble formation in fluid inclusion? Uh, and uh, some kind of microphone. No, we are working, the, the, all the work on the fluid inclusion we are doing on, in Von Hof lab. We don't have any more, our lab of our own, we, in the past we had, now we don't have. So, you know, more things to do in the, in the future. It's nice to be young, then you can think about the future. <laughs> okay, now, if you then don't have any more questions or comments, I would like to invite those who, who would be interested in talking uh, uh, to the lecturer in a more informal way. Uh, we will have some coffees, refreshments uh, in the uh, Tudosh Club, uh, just uh, one stage below us. And uh, we can meet there and uh, have some chat together. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you very much. Really fascinating. Yeah. And I hope you will enjoy uh, your stay until tomorrow. Thank you very much, really. Thank you for listening.